I once got into an argument with the dean of a very prestigious U.S. research university, and she said, Larry, all we want from our writers is that their writing be clear and organized. She had brought me in as a consultant. She said, Larry, I want you to help us, everyone on this campus, from students, faculty, everyone, I want them to be clear and organized in their work. And I said, no, you don't. She said, I beg your pardon? <laughs> and I said, no, you don't. It's not that I'm saying you want them to be unclear and disorganized, but this is not what counts as success at your university. She said, what do you mean? I said, tell me something. If you have a faculty member who writes clear, organized prose and doesn't get grants, doesn't get published, and doesn't get cited, do you give them tenure? And she said, no, of course not. <laughs> right. These are not the measures of good, effective academic writing. Far more important than these is being persuasive. Sorry, I don't spell or write very well. But far more important than any of that is being valuable. Because if your writing is clear and worthless, it's worthless. If it's organized and worthless, it's worthless. If it's persuasive and worthless, it's worthless. And she said, yeah, Larry, I get that, but she said, this is what writing's for, this is what substance is for. And I said, you're wrong about that too, Dean. I said, I can show you the ways that academics create value with words. And here's something you need to know about readers and writers. The patterns of language that you use to help yourself think are different from the patterns of language that you use when you read. So what happens is, experts use language with particular patterns that help them to think, but their readers, even if the readers are other experts, readers use language in a different pattern. So what happens is, these patterns interfere with each other. The writer's writing patterns serve the writer, but they do not serve the readers. So what we needed to do was help experts recognize that the writing patterns they needed to create are actually interfering with the value and even clarity, organization, and persuasion with their readers. Here's the second, the third problem you have with writing. The first is, it's damned hard. The second is, you have to use your writing to help yourself to think and then change it for readers, and that is emotionally and intellectually difficult. And here's the third problem. You've been trained to think of writing under rules, generalizations, stylistic rules like don't use passive verbs, and short sentences are clearer than long sentences. Two things. One, those rules are false. They're just demonstrably false. There is no argument to be had about it. And two, if you think about rules, you're not thinking about your readers. Value is not created by rules. It's created by readers and specific readers. Specific readers are not generic. He thinks, because he was trained in school, that the function of his writing is to communicate his thoughts to the world. The simple version of this is, he thinks writing is like this. Here's the writer, here's the reader, and the job of the text is to convey an idea from the reader's head, to the, the writer's head to the reader's head. That's what he was trained to do in school. That is not the function of your writing anymore, ever. The function of your writing is to take a particular group of readers before, to take those readers someplace else after, and the text moves them. So, 
the model that now dominates academic discourse, it's not in every field, but it's, it's dominant, is a model that I'd like to represent this way. There's a bunch of people having a conversation, might be a conversation about history, might be about sociology, might be about marketing, might be about whatever. And this conversation is moving through space, time, it's moving. And what's happening is new ideas are coming in and old ideas are being excreted, as it were. So you've got some stuff that's in the conversation and new stuff's coming in and a lot of other stuff's being left behind. And on this model, on this model, what drives new work is its continuity with what went before. And so you've been trained to adopt a vocabulary of continuity, that your work is consistent with what came before. Well, these days, what drives this conversation forward is tension. It's going to look like this. For work to seem valuable to your readers, the first thing they have to perceive in the text is that there exists a problem. You have to get rid of some model in your head that texts work like from background to thesis, or worse, general to specific. That's even worse. But it doesn't work with background to thesis. It works problem-solution. You think of your text as being a solution to a problem, and then you begin the text by saying, here's the problem. Problems have two main aspects, two things you have to get done. In order for there to be a problem, the reader must first perceive that the situation is unstable. That is, that the current situation that the reader is in has something unstable about it. It could be tension, should be contradiction and extreme ends, but in some point it has to be, uh, in some way it has to be unstable. Secondarily, this instability has to either impose costs on the reader or the movement to stability has to provide benefits to the reader. And you see how crucial it is that we talk about specific readers. When a Nobel Prize is announced, there are at least two and sometimes three different explanations of the prize. Now, everybody assumes that the difference between these three, two, well, three, two, make it simpler, is that one of them is for people who don't understand the science, and one of them is for people who do understand the science. That is, the Nobel Prize would say, here's a public announcement of this prize. It's usually two or three paragraphs. And then here's advanced information on the prize. And it's all this highly technical stuff. And those of you, those people who are naive, there might be some people in this audience, who think that the reason for these two is the different amount of expertise knowledge that the two different communities have about the research. That's not why they do two announcements. Because one of those communities values pragmatic problems, and the other one values conceptual problems. So, what happens is, what drives the difference and the need for two statements is not the amount of knowledge, it's that they value different things. And the Swedish Royal Academy is absolutely brilliant at this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah.